thank you very much. I see so many familiar names. Uh, I wish wish we were uh, together and in Toulouse. That would be fun. I'd like to see that new building finally. Anyways, uh, happy to talk about the, this paper. And I see a couple of my co-authors are on. So when we get tough questions, uh, I'm happy to, to share, let them share in the uh, opportunity to clarify. All right. So this paper is about this general uh, data protection regulation called GDPR. And you I'm, probably you know what it is, but if you go to websites and you see them asking you whether you accept cookies, then uh, you know, you're living in, in a GDPR world. It's because of GDPR that websites need to ask you to give permission uh, for the use of your data. That's sort of one of the aspects, one of the visible aspects of GDPR to, to lay people and even you know, sophisticated people. Uh, that's why you see the accept button a lot. Uh, I guess in sort of a deeper sense, GDPR does a few things. It makes restrictions on the use of personal information, which if you think about it, the way the web tends to work, uh, that's going to make ad revenue uh, lower uh, because sites won't know as much about people. It also has compliance regulations, which are going to raise the costs of being a, an app or a website or whatever. And if you believe those possibilities, uh, and they seem like plausible possibilities at the outset, then you might think that it could uh, you know, raise exit and perhaps reduce entry. And if that's true, it could have big potential welfare consequences, especially, now here's an ax that I personally have to grind, especially if product uh, quality or value is unpredictable at entry. You know, this is one of, a, I guess, a bunch of papers I've written where I think about the welfare benefits or costs of either getting a lot of new products, or in this case, maybe losing some products, and unpredictability is a big part of that story. So uh, if you think about uh, unpredictability and the welfare gains from digitization, so many of you know, the last 10 years or so, a lot of my talks have been about a related but different phenomenon, but well, what's happened under digitization, the enormous growth in the number of new products and, and how beneficial is that to consumers? Now, the reason unpredictability is important in that context, and frankly here as well, if product quality were perfectly predictable and costs fell relative to revenue, we'd get a bunch of new products. But because of predictability, these products would all be worse than the cost threshold, uh, the old cost threshold. So it wouldn't that be that big a deal. On the other hand, if product quality is unpredictable at entry, and the products I often talk about are things like music and books and movies, and we all know that it's completely unpredictable, or almost completely unpredictable in those con uh, contexts, whether products will turn out to be valuable or not. Well, in that case, things that cause an increase in the number of products entering can have a really big effect on welfare because the new products with unpredictability are as good on average as the existing products. Well, with that kind of backdrop, again, about my ax to grind in this context, is that it raises the question whether GDPR, by potentially reducing entry, especially, and I really want to focus on the distinction between entry and exit, but by potentially reducing new entry, is it like digitization in reverse, you know, causing us to take a lot fewer draws and therefore to discover a lot fewer valuable products? Okay, so the context and the questions. The context we're going to study is the Google Play Store. There are 4.1 million apps. We're going to look at this period between July 2016 and uh, October 2019, and this is apps for, for Android devices. And we're going to start with four descriptive questions. First of all, what happened to entry and exit and the number of apps available? I guess in that's some sense, that's already three, but we're going to call that one question. What happened to the privacy invasiveness of apps? What happened to app usefulness as inferred from, from usage that the post GDPR birth cohort apps get? Now, there's a lot packed into that sentence, and I'll talk a lot about that over the next 25 minutes or so. What happened to app development costs as one might infer from the usage that they get? You know, if you think about free entry and needing to get revenue to cover costs. And then we're going to turn to a, a, a sort of a light structural exercise in, we try, in which we try to draw some inferences about the long run welfare impacts. Uh, of the uh, of the, the what we'll document as a reduction in entry in a context with a great deal of unpredictability. By the way, what are the ground rules here? Do we get questions going through, or, or do we do we do we what do we what's the rules? I mean, I sh probably should keep my mouth shut, but I want to be fair. I guess it's up to you. Um... Okay, I mean, I'm happy, especially clarifying questions at any time, and then you know we can talk about deep stuff later. But all right, fine. So a little bit about the app market. There are two big platforms. There's Apple and there's Android. Again, we're going to be studying Android. Just a little bit about the economics of how this works. Uh, the revenue direct from users is on the order of a third. And so these are kind of big numbers, 43 billion in 16, up to 83 billion in 19. Ad revenue is a bigger deal, 80 billion, uh, up to 200 billion over this time period. Now, Android overall is something like a uh, uh, about from 40 up to about 100 billion over this period, again, because Apple is a big separate chunk of the market. 
So just, just I guess this is a slide that says this is kind of a big market and it's growing. On the market size uh, side, the number of, of devices is about a billion in June of 2000, 2014, up to about 2.5 billion in May of 2019, which is just a useful background fact. It's also going to play the role of our market size and some of the estimates down the road. Okay, so a little bit about GDPR, and I'm, I'm not a super expert on this, but I think I know enough to tell you something. So what under GDPR, what developers have to do is to protect the user data. It's really about giving users control over their own data. And so they have to protect it by, quote, design and default. Now, it binds on, on, on essentially the whole planet in the following sense. All EU-based sites, as well as sites visited by EU users. That's why even non, you know, you go to a non-EU site and you see this, do I accept cookies business? Because if they want to, to stay available to EU users who are a big part of the world economy, they have to comply. So there's this is actually a challenge for us in the next few slides. There is essentially no really untreated part of the world, at least none that we could identify. In any event, though, uh, there are pretty, you know, toothy fines for violations, and these fines have been imposed. Um, now, you know, if fewer users are going to allow cookies, are going to press that permit button, then ads are going to be less valuable. And as I already said on the intro slide, the bottom line possibility is that revenue would fall and, and costs would rise. Now, it passed in 2016 and became effective in 2018. What we have on the right side is just a, some pictures of sort of time series reflecting awareness of GDPR. So this is like Google searches on GDPR, GDPR comments at Reddit and Stack Overflow and editing of the, of the Wikipedia GDPR article. This is all just to say, yeah, this isn't just something we're thinking about. I think that the world was aware of this, especially as it, as it came into, into effect, including developers. You know, moreover, uh, we and my co-authors did a survey of some German app developers just to ask them, you know, about kind of how do they understand GDPR to, to be affecting them in prospect. And 85% of them mentioned administrative burdens, 48% mentioned uh, additional costs. One in seven of them mentioned removing an app, exiting, and one in 11 reported not launching an app in prospect uh, under the prospect of GDPR. So all of this is just to say, this isn't just something we're imagining might be important. I think the world is aware of it, including the, the, the players or participants in, in the market we're studying. So there's a lot of literature by now, and I, 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 I hope I'm, I probably missed tons, but I mean, I'm, uh, but I want to divide it into chunks. So one chunk is just about the welfare benefit of new products. And of course, very famous papers about that are minivans and apple cinnamon Cheerio, Cheerios. But you know, those are kind of contexts where a product enters and we sort of know what it is and how, how valuable is it. Work I've done with Luis Aguiar has been about this question. Well, when success is unpredictable, what's the welfare benefit of new products? And now it's a little more complicated because you have to think about which products would or would not exist in the absence of some kind of, you know, some, some change like digitization. There's also a, a kind of a long tradition in thinking about entrepreneurship as experimentation, which is not unrelated. You know, the idea is new products are unpredictable. And so, you know, entrepreneurship is like experimentation. Then there's a sort of a series of subliteratures just on the effect of GDPR on various kinds of outcomes. Uh, uh, you know, for, you know, there's a bunch of interesting, careful papers simply even asking, does GDPR have an effect on the extent to which uh, uh, websites collect data and stuff like that? Um, I don't think there's uh, I don't think there's much over on the on, on what we're doing exactly on innovation, although that may have changed. Then you know it's related also just to generally this literature on on privacy and because of course GDPR at, at, you know at, at heart is a is a privacy regulation and I guess at some deep sense what we're talking about in this paper is the the some maybe unintended cost of pursuing uh, pursuing the privacy regulation. Then of course there's also a bunch of papers just about the app market per se and so this is all all relevant useful stuff. All right, so our theoretical framework in, in the 40 minute version of this talk uh, is that you know GDPR reduces revenue, raises costs. Now, the way we're going to think about it, it's a free entry world. And so you know think about free entry, if revenues uh, fall and, and costs rise, you expect a smaller e equilibrium number of apps. And maybe it takes a while for all that to happen. But I want to emphasize a couple things. Uh, one is really different effects on and of entry and, and exit. Um, and moreover, the, 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 the entry side, which is really going to be where the important action is, there's been some confusion about this among our critics, but the, the effects of, uh, of, of changed entry are really going to depend a lot on the predictability of app quality. So exit, let's, let's sort of break this down. On the exit side, apps that are already in existence have known realized quality. That is, their developers know how many people have downloaded, how many people are using it. it that's not, there's no uncertainty left there. And so uh, if revenue falls and the cost of bringing the firm or the app into compliance rise, we would expect pretty immediate exit. 
but the exit's going to be low value apps, the apps that aren't worth updating. Okay, so exit, you know, we may see a giant extinction event, but it's not going to be a big deal because it's going to be the really low value apps that exit. Entry is a little different. Here, you know, with, with GDPR coming, uh, app developers expect uh, uh, less revenue and it's going to be more costly to be compliant. So we expect entry to fall even in advance of the, of, of the uh, you know, as it's being discussed or understood to be coming into existence. Now, again, if you think about the welfare implications of these exit and entry uh, you know, outcomes, the exit of low-value apps, again, while dramatic looking, is not going to be a big deal. If a bunch of apps nobody's using leave the market, not a big deal from the welfare standpoint. Um, decreased entry, though, this is sort of the dog that doesn't bark so obviously. This is potentially a much bigger deal, especially over time. Okay, so what we're going to, you know, sort of the, the, the title of the paper refers to this lost generation of the apps that don't get launched that would have been valuable to consumers. All right, now I want to also talk a little bit about an extreme case that's not quite true, but it's close enough to being true to be and, and quite easy to understand that it's useful to talk about. What if it's literally the case that nobody knows anything? And here I'm quoting William Goldman, the screenwriter who wrote Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and also this wonderful book about Hollywood called Adventures in the Screen Trade. Screen Trade, excuse me. And it, almost his mantra is nobody knows anything, which is his description of the total inability of people in Hollywood to predict which movies will be successful. Well, in our context, nobody knows anything means that uh, apps that, you know, if we have an, an X percent reduction in entry, uh, um, you know, what, what usage share would they have counted for? Well, again, if, if success were perfectly predictable, only the worst apps would enter and it would be much less than X percent. But if, we're, if app success is completely unpredictable, an X percent reduction in entry is going to have a long run X percent reduction in, in the amount of usage that those apps account for. OK, now I'm not saying so just to be clear, we're going to worry later on about how apps can be substitutable for one another. And so that's not going to be an X percent reduction in, in consumer surplus. But still, that that's a bit of intuition that's useful for us as we think about if there's an X percent reduction in entry, what's the reduction in the share of usage accounted for by the new smaller entry cohorts? And if it's all the way to X, then that's no predictability a complete unpredictability or nobody knows anything to borrow the phrase. Okay, so a little bit about the data. Uh, we have a quarter, so the data are aggregated to quarter, or we put them together as quarterly data. It's a quarterly panel over this period 15 to 19. We see all apps available each period, a little bit of effort that I'll explain in a minute. The way we're gonna measure usage, so we have two bytes at the usage apple. One thing we observe in the data is the number of installations, a categoric measure of the number of installations, not a continuous measure, like over a million or whatever. Uh, we also observe the, the change in the number of times an app has been rated. That's a nice continuous measure. Uh, and I, I just say now, we're going to focus on that. We're going to mainly use that measure. But over on the right-hand side, we have a little picture showing the relationship between these two measures, the categoric one and the continuous one. And they're, they're pretty monotonically related. So we feel more or less comfortable using this change in the number of ratings. But I mean, to be clear, we wish we had direct quantity data. We don't. Uh, it's a problem studying this market. So there are some details, though. So the biggest detail in data collection is that the, the way we, we, we uh, collect the list of operating apps is we look at a big, long list of apps, which is not all apps, and we query the app store and ask it, hey, and, and by the way, the, when you query the app store for an app, it says here are a bunch of related apps. So we use this process of querying and, and adding all the suggested related apps to the list of apps we think are, are in existence. And we do this actually for, I think there was like a year before the data collection period started to sort of get it to converge. So we had all the apps that, you know, in existence and any new app showing up there was literally a new app, right? So anyways, we start with a long list and add the related apps, but there's still a problem. Even though, let's say we have all the apps as of the beginning of the sample period, it's not the case that we are gonna see every app right when it enters. There's what we call a delayed observation problem. I'm gonna show you a little bit later. You know, uh, in the, we observe some fraction of apps in the first quarter in which they exist and some other fraction by the second quarter in which they exist and so forth. But that's really important for us because if we're gonna make some claim about entry falling toward the end of the sample period, we don't wanna mistake the fact that we haven't seen something that does exist for actual reduction in entry. So that's why this is sort of a boring issue, but it's really important for us to not claim that the mere fact we don't see something yet means that entry has fallen. I mean, just in short, what we're going to have to do is say things like, well, 
how many apps do we see that were born, you know, that are observed within one quarter of their birth or within two, two quarters of their birth to create an apples to apples time series uh, covering both the pre and post GDPR period? Uh, there's also another problem with sometimes we don't observe an app, like we observe it in quarter one and in quarter three, but not in quarter two, but that one we just sort of punt and linearly uh, interpolate the, uh, uh, the cumulative number of rating measure uh, between the two periods. Okay, so th those, are the, those are the skeletons in the data collection closet. So we have uh, uh, 4.1 million apps, 31.4 million app quarter observations. Um, we do observe some app characteristics that we use. We use uh, we observe the category in which the app is. You know, it's a, is it a game or whatever. Uh, the download price for those that have a price, uh, or whether it has a download price. We have some privacy variables that we use to characterize how intrusive apps are before and after. Um, and so, so let, let's just look sort of at a first glimpse. The number of apps available. Just the number of apps available. And it's pretty clear that the number of apps available has been rising, then falls. It falls even a bit before the uh, onset of GDPR. There's a lot of app reduction, okay? A lot of, lot of apps exited around GDPR. I mean, the thing about this picture, although it's a little bit dramatic, it doesn't really distinguish any of the different effects that we think are interesting, but still something maybe is, is going on. There's some kind of big extinction event. I like this dinosaur slide. Um, but this isn't the answer to the question. Because this could be a bunch of low-value apps exiting. So this is not the answer, OK? This is not the answer, but it's a fun picture. Um, yeah, it's not the answer for two reasons, again. One is low-value apps might exit. And besides, even if apps exit and other remaining apps are closed substitutes, again, this wouldn't be the answer for welfare. OK, so let's, uh, I, I want to, a couple of slides here that are that are like sort of boring, but I think kind of important. They're sort of the way in which we deal with this delayed uh, uh, observation problem. So um, we want to say what happens to entry over time. And it would be a simple question if we just had clean data where we observed every app entering in each quarter. But it's not quite. It's not quite simple because of the delayed observation problem. If we have an observed end of sample entrance, it looks like entry is falling, even though maybe it's not. So the idea is to have fair comparisons, like apps entering this quarter that are also first observed in this quarter. So N is like the number of apps, and T is calendar time, and V is vintage. T minus V equals zero means born this quarter, right? So we could use this idea for, for any, any K, any age of apps and just what are, you know, the, the apps observed this quarter uh, born, first observed this quarter born K quarters ago. And that gets around this sort of delayed observation kind of problem. Anyways, an example of that is apps born this quarter, right? So there's some noise here, but, and it's falling and it sort of continues to fall uh, uh, post GDPR. Not quite the answer yet. This is just an illustration of the idea. We can use a similar idea for our usage measures. And why are we going to study usage? Well, usage is our glimpse into welfare. And I think uh, I want to be careful. I'm going to use the word usage. I think some people give us a hard time about that. This is, I mean, of course, it's it's liter it's not literally like hours spent using the app this period. So that you're right to give me a hard time in that sense. It is simply our continuous measure of the extent to which the app is, is well, uh, it's not quite installations, right? I showed you it was correlated or strongly related to installations. So think of it as a proxy for the usual measure of the purchase of a durable good, which is, inst you know, installations. But it's, yeah, it's a few steps removed from what you wish you had, but you do what you can when you decide the question's interesting. So QJT is, quote, usage. Again, it's delta number of people rating the apps between this quarter and last. So again, I'll call it usage, but I've been trying to be clear what it really is. Um, usage of app J in quarter T. We'll define SJT as this usage measure divided by market size, because that's going to be useful for, for down the road for the logic stuff. And you know, S, we'll also define an STV, which aggregates together the Js that are born in vintage V. Okay. Collective usage during quarter T of apps born in vintage V. But again, I've, I've already kind of apologized extensively for the word usage, but I don't want to explain it in every sentence. So I'm going to keep using the word in the talk. Now, if you look at this usage Joe? measure, oh, question? I think Luis has a question. Oh, great. So uh, Joe, it seems to me that one important element in this world is discovery. And you're using the number of apps that were discovered. And correct me if I'm wrong, are you assuming that that uh, uh, process is constant with respect to, to uh, the number of uh, new apps? And so I'm not. I'm not sure what you mean by discovery, though, um, or, or I mean, so I mean, I mean, a, a consumers uh, finding out about the existing of new apps. 
So we our measure of the number of apps in, exi in existence is not consumer discovery of it, although our, our usage measure. So this may be what you're talking about. The thing we're calling usage is based on changes in the ratings of it or changes in the number of times apps have been rated. So if that's what you mean, then yes, we're you can only you're only used uh, to the extent that you're discovered. OK, maybe I should wait then. Uh, OK, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I don't want please do come back. I want to make, make sure we, we talk about it. So okay. th these over on the right hand side, this picture is just this usage measure for uh, uh, one, two, and three uh, uh, quarter old apps over time. And again, it's, it's, a, it's against it's against the birth quarter on the x-axis. Sorry, is there a question? Yeah, I, I think Chuck has a uh, comment. Chuck, do you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, but yeah. So uh, you you say that you know the value of apps is unpredictable. And you know I'm willing to to accept this for games and things like this, but there are lots of apps which are just extensions of other services. Uh, for instance, your bank, your airline, and so on. And I would think this would be a totally different category in terms of predictability. Your bank pretty well knows if it launches another app, you know, how many people are going to use it, and so on. Yeah, no, I so we're not we're going to be a little light on heterogeneity, but what I will show you in a few slides, I will show you evidence consistent with the idea of unpredictability in the following kind of sense. If it's really true that app success is unpredictable, then not all that then reductions in entry should not only have reductions in aggregate usage, but for example, the share of apps born by quarter that eventually reach some absolute threshold of high usage, again, by our measure, that should also fall. And I'll show you that. So I, I entirely concede the point that, you know, any app from Google that's already installed on your phone is probably predictably valuable. Um, and we're, we're, we're not gonna be thinking about that kind of heterogeneity in the way we model it, but I will show you evidence about the relationship between uh, birth cohort timing and the propensity to achieve an absolutely high level of usage, which, and, and I, I will hint now that that's gonna be very consistent with very little predictability. Okay. I think time for the next slide, maybe. So, so let's let's now try to address the four descriptive questions. Again, the first one being, what's the effect of GDPR on entry, exit, and number of apps available? Um, what happened to the privacy intrusiveness of the apps? What happened to app usefulness? Uh, that is, how much quote usage do post GDPR uh, uh, app birth cohorts get relative to pre? And what happened to app development costs? Again, as inferred from average usage uh, per app. So first of all, exit is, is really dramatic. It's a large immediate effect, which by the way, we, we kind of predicted or I guess uh, it's intuitive in the sense that there's no reason to exit until you have to comply. And at, at the time you decide to exit, you know which apps are worthless. And so it's, that's the time to do it. Um, so there's a huge, a huge spike in exit. But again, this is also not, not, uh, not gonna be driving our interesting effects. Now, of course, uh, I should also say that we very much, you know, wish as, as with everyone who studies GDPR for an untreated part of the world so we could do diffs and diffs. And we really can't find, we tried pretty hard to find an untreated part of the world and, and couldn't find one. So I'll go ahead and apologize in advance for that. Uh, we, but we do look at a, a number of features of the, of the exit and the, the change in entry that make us think it's GDPR, and not something else. Um, so anyways, uh, but as I want, just want to make sure there's no Although this picture is dramatic, this is not our headline picture because this is a bunch of low-value apps exiting doesn't really have a lot of effect on, on welfare. Entry, so this, this is sort of more important. Now, we already had a hint about this just in when I described how we sort of apples to apples compare usage measures over time. But what we're now going to do is aggregate the data by calendar time, that is calendar quarter and vintage of birth going to aggregate it together and estimate these a simple model that uh, just a simple descriptive model that says entry um, uh, 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 sorry the number of apps that, that we see operating in calendar time t that were born at period v is equal to some mu for age so that's going to uh, uh, and then a, and then an eta I guess for for vintage and so these age effects uh, are going to arise from depreciation how many apps are first observed t minus v quarters after birth and the, the ADAs are the vintage effects of interest. After accounting for the delayed observation, is entry lower for those, those, uh, those time periods, those Vs that are after GDPR, or I, I, in some sense, I should say, after GDPR is known to be on the horizon and especially after GDPR. So these, this is a picture of those, those ADAs where they're set to zero at the GDPR onset 
quarter. And so you see it's pretty constant, pretty constant at zero. And then it falls for the post GDPR vintages. Again, on the X axis is the vintages of birth, not calendar time. And on average, now we could, you could quibble, uh, but let me just say the average for the post period is 47% the, 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 the below the pre period because it's, you know, it's exponentiation of the log coefficient and whatever, blah, blah, blah. You could say, hey, it really seems to fall a lot at the end. So maybe it's not quite 47. I don't know what it is, but it's kind of a big negative number is the claim that we're making in the paper. Now let's talk about some, some uh, just some, some other evidence I think that is important to take into account. What happened at other platforms? So here we have some app monster data on the Apple platform. Remember this paper is about the Google platform. So we have a Google entry picture and an Apple entry picture or, or time series in the same picture. And what you do see is that there's, there's, there's some reduction happening at both platforms. The Apple one seems to go into effect or occur e even earlier uh, than at the, but, but the point of this picture is to say, whatever we think is happening doesn't seem to be happening only at Google. Because some people, and we actually talk about in the paper how Google did various things to clean out their app store and so forth. But it's, since it's ha some things are happening at Apple as well, it doesn't seem as though it's all going to be driven or maybe any of it driven by Google, uh, Google policing of its own, its own environment. Okay, full stop. This is, uh, this is, an entry picture, but it's entry achieving high thresholds of success. So think about this as being relevant to usage as well. So what happens to the entry of ultimately successful apps? So we define a sort of arbitrary, but we define these thresholds of 10,000 eventual installations or 100,000 installations as measures of success. And then we ask, you know, what happens to the entry that achieves this level of success? And you can see that th these pictures look a fair bit like those raw usage pictures. Remember, we said that entry fell by uh, 47, or sorry, the entry picture, entry fell by 47% on average in the post GDPR period. And we're saying that ultimately successful entry fell by 40 and 44% respectively. That's not quite 47, but it's pretty close. So it's consistent with it's nearly consistent with complete unpredictability. And I, the only, I don't mean to push that too hard. I just, it's very much easier expositorily to talk about complete unpredictability, but I promise you I will talk about partial predictability before we're done. And so I won't, I won't be dishonest about that. But it's, it's really consistent with very little predictability. Oh, I see a hand, Aaron. Hey, um, so I'm trying to understand um, with some of these apps, uh, if, a uh, developer might have um, planned to have a new version of an app, and then maybe this developer um, releases a new app by name um, to, to signal that it's a much higher quality. Uh, now having to comply with this regulation that's going to change the timing of when I'm going to move on to the next version. I was wondering if you can track developers and see if um, they're just changing the timing of when they're moving on to the next app. Hmm, that's a good question. So the, expert, the world expert on updating apps is Ben Leiden. I don't know if he's here with us today. I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so just to, if one were to explore this, the question would be which updates show up as new entry as opposed to just showing up as updates? Because I think for us, updates are just updates and not entry. Um, but you're thinking GDPR could affect the timing of when... Yeah, I mean, it's so like, it, you know, I, again, kind of depends on the type of app, but you can imagine... Um, some apps show up as a different name altogether when it's an updated version of it. For other apps, you care about the, having the same app. Yeah, um, so I, I may, may, maybe my co-authors have insight into this, but that's a good question, thanks. Hannah, nice to see you guys, so, so by the way. <laughs> This similar, I guess, similar question, but um, do you see the new apps, but that are uh, created by developers that are serial developers? Because then it's not an update, but it's a new app, but it's a, you know, the fifth uh, uh, app uh, that is doing a similar thing as previous apps, or they have enough, um, enough experience, and then they are delaying the issuing of a new app because of the GDPR. Yeah, I, so I don't know. We do know who the developers are, and we do some stuff that's not in the talk that is in the, in other versions of the slides and perhaps the paper about, about ad developers as opposed to uh, products entering and exit, exiting. But uh, yeah, this question I think related to Aaron's, I'm not sure I know the answer off the top of my head. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of push forward because I know there'll be time for more discussion as we go. Um, so, so remember, I told you entry fell. 
I told you entry of ultimately successful apps fell nearly as much as entry. Now, if we want to think about kind of usefulness of apps, we already had a hint about that from the reduction in the number of ultimately successful apps. Kind of the more direct way is just to ask what that usage measure uh, uh, for apps. And so this is, again, this usage of one and three and two quarter old apps. But if we all, and this all falls after, for vintage is born after GDPR, arguably falling a bit before. But if we want to just pool the data together and do the similar exercise to what we did for entry, we can do that. And so what we're interested in are these rows, the vintage effects of interest. And again, think about this as the some measure of the usefulness of the birth cohorts born after GDPR. After accounting for age is collective usage lower for post-GDPR vintages. And so if we make these, these pictures, um, you know, indeed we have, uh, we have these, these uh, pictures falling uh, afterwards, that's falling after the GDPR period. And actually it's about 45% on average, so very close to the reduction in entry. It's it's an almost, but not a quite, nobody knows anything environment. There's some predictability, but not much. And again, predictability, which we'll talk about toward the end, makes makes this a lot more work. Um, it shows that we went to grad school and stuff, but it doesn't add terribly much. Well, actually that's not true. It does add, it does add something important, but but don't, don't feel bad that we won't get to it till the end. Um, two additional descriptive facts uh, that I think are interesting. One is about, um, average usage per app, excuse me, average usage per app. So if you believe our story, you'd think that you need more usage in equilibrium after the, after the, uh, uh, after the, the rule, remember, because revenue has fallen per user, probably, and the cost of compliance has risen. So we would expect apps to need more users per app. And so that's really kind of what this, what this measure is. It's, it's a measure of the average usage per app by birth cohort, and it rises uh, for the post GDPR period. Okay, you need more usage to be viable in a GDPR world than you did in a pre GDPR world. One other thing I wanna say is about uh, uh, privacy intrusiveness. So we have these sort of measures of, of how, how intrusive the apps are. And this is very important for us to acknowledge because you know, at, at, at what is this paper about? This paper is about a potential cost of GDPR. Well, GDPR also has a potential benefit. Right, especially its proponents and any sane person would say, well, hey, the goal of the thing was to, to protect privacy. So it seems quite you know, sensible just to take a look at this and just ask, is there something going on here? And yeah, the privacy intrusiveness measures are falling. You could say they were already falling, maybe they continue to fall, but it's at least possible that there's some privacy benefit arising from, uh, from GDPR, which we wanna be uh, uh, forthright about. I mean, one thing it doesn't seem to do though, you know, you could imagine a world in which the privacy benefits of the post GDPR apps uh, are so great that people flock to them and use them. And notice we didn't see that in the usage measures. Um, but I mean, you could also say all apps have to now be, uh, have to uh, not now have those privacy benefits of GDPR. So maybe you wouldn't expect flocking to the post GDPR cohorts. But anyways, the point of this slide is to say, yeah, we know that the act is about protecting privacy and there's at least some evidence that it does. So all this table does is to, to, to reduce to a scalar each of those things that I said was either below or above before. So I think I already told you the answer here, so I'm not maybe going to dwell on it. Uh, but these are just the average post-GDPR relative to pre-GDPR effect, effects rather in the pictures that we just saw in the last five slides or so. Okay, so now I want to turn to welfare. I mean, so I mean, just maybe I should take stock for a second. I mean, I, I think what we have so far is evidence that, again, the exit evidence is fun, but irrelevant. We have evidence that entry fell, well, let's say a lot, but the number we were bandying about is 47%. We see that the entry of ultimately successful apps fell by on the order of 40 to 44%. We see that the average usage of the birth cohorts born afterwards fall about 45%. So that's where we are so far, kind of, so it looks like maybe, maybe something happened here. Um, but now we wanna to try to translate this into some kind of welfare measure. So we'll focus on consumer surplus. And, and the game plan here is, uh, is, well, is as follows. We're going to compare a pre-GDPR period in which there's whatever, 1.1 million available apps to a hypothetical post-GDPR equilibrium with 47% fewer apps. So this is long run analysis, right? This is not like the immediate effect of GDPR. This is in the hypothetical long run. Now it's easy-ish if, if nobody knows anything, because then what would you do to do this counterfactual? You would remove 47% of apps at random. Right, and so that's why I like that as a rhetorical device. Let's let's try that first. Now it's harder since that's not quite right, 
uh, and we're also, you know, we're going to need an entry model to think about the order in which apps entry if we're going to take seriously this, this predictability stuff. But again, for a little while, we can just think about removing 47% of apps at random. Now, we also need a way to translate somehow data into consumer surplus measures. So we're going to estimate uh, a logit model of entry, which we can then use to calculate uh, calculate uh, consumer surplus. So in particular, my favorite workhorse here would be the, the nested logit model that allows for some substi substitutability across apps. We don't want to say that apps are all distinctly valuable. Instead, this, this model has sort of two kinds of ways in which apps, well, first of all, apps differ simply because of their mean utility differing, but they also have substitutability operating through the nested logit parameter, which we estimate the substitution parameter sigma, which we estimate to be like 0.36. And, and by the way, we're also going to do a bunch of sensitivity analysis in, in, a little later in the talk in the paper where we say, you know, you tell me what you want that substitutability parameter to be and we'll translate the result of interest into, into some, other, some other number. Okay. Uh, I should also mention we, don't, uh, we do have a price. That is, some apps are priced, most apps are free, and that's the purchase price, not the in-app usage uh, price. We're not actually going to use the price parameter. We're not going to dollarize the or euroize the consumer surplus estimate. We're just going to think about proportionate changes in the consumer surplus estimate. So think about the consumer surplus formula, which I should have put on the slide, but didn't has a one over alpha in it. But we'll be dividing one over alpha in the counterfactual world over one over alpha in the, you know, in the in the status quo world. So so that's that's going to go away. So we're making our lives sort of as easy as we can. All right, so let's start with that intuitive remove 47% of apps at random. So when you do that, <clears throat> you get a pretty big 34% reduction in consumer surplus. Okay, so this picture on the right-hand side does a two little bits of uh, sort of robustness, if you will. And one is to vary sigma. So we have sigma varying between 0.25 and 0.75. The, the baseline, the dark line is the 0.361 that we estimate. Then we also have what fraction of apps being removed on the x-axis. So this is kind of a, pardon the expression, we report you decide a uh, uh, slide. If you think that you, know, you want more substitutability like 0.75, then the reduction in consumer surplus would be on the order of what, 15% with a 47% reduction in the number of apps. If you think 47 overstates it, you can take it over and, and say 80% of the existing apps are available. Anyway, so, so there are a lot of numbers here, but I think that, or a lot of potential numbers, a continuum of them. But I think that for a pretty wide range of entry reductions, and substitution parameters, there's a, a large-ish effect of losing, uh, losing a bunch of apps, okay? So uh, the bottom of this slide, though, then again says, but remember, there is some predictability. There is some predictability. For example, the 47% entry reduction reduces those apps attaining the 10,000 threshold by 43%, which is less than 47, and reduces apps attaining the 100,000 threshold by 40%. So maybe we should worry a little bit about some predictability. So let's, let's do that. Here's a dense, kind of a dense slide. So um, the, the idea is that, uh, let's say that, that entry occurs if you expect your quality to be high enough so that the marginal entrant uh, would cover costs. So how are we going to think about this? We have realized quality. Realized quality is the usage measure, or, or it's basically the delta in the logit associated with the usage measure for, the, for app J. So we know how, how good it turned out to be, if you will. We're going to pretend that we're going to come up with a forecast of how good it's going to be by taking its true value and adding noise to it. And then pretending that the entrant takes this true value plus noise, and that's what they know. They know true value plus noise, and then they decide whether to enter. Now, we parameterize this, 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 this unpredictability with a parameter kappa times a normal 0, 1 variable. Uh, I forget, is that eta? Whatever that thing is. OK, so if kappa is 0, it's perfect predictability. If kappa goes gets bigger than zero, there's some unpredictability. Okay, so kappa is a scaling parameter. Now, th the game plan here is to try to figure out what, uh, what kappa parameter, what degree of unpredictability would cause the simulation to deliver the following fact, the following facts, I should say. Like what fraction, if you had a 47% reduction in entry, um, how much predictability would you need so that would deliver whatever we just said, a 43% reduction in apps attaining uh, uh, the threshold of 10,000 uh, 10, or the, whatever the threshold was for 100,000. So that's how we're going to identify or calibrate that parameter. We know that there's some predictability because the, 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 um, you know, the reduction in successful apps wasn't quite as big as the reduction in apps. 
So, you know, kind of conceptually, try a kappa, drop the four, uh, the bottom 40 per seven, 40, excuse me, let me, let me try to say this again in English. So to, to have a kappa, draw a simulated, uh, you know, use the, the, the true deltas, then draw some delta j's given the kappa you assumed. Now drop the 40, the bottom 47% of them to simulate a 47% reduction uh, in, in entry, and then check and see what's happened to the reduction in the apps attaining a certain quality threshold. Choose the kappa that delivers the reduction in post-GDPR uh, uh, usage that we actually observe. Okay, that's that's what we do. And so, uh, you know, good apps are more likely to enter. We're going to continue using the the logit estimates we had before. I think this slide is a little repetitive, and I see a typo. But we end up we find a, a, a we find a kappa that, and maybe a more intuitive way to talk about kappa is in terms of the correlation between the expected quality and the realized quality. And a correlation on the order of 0.12 is what rationalizes the data, okay? 0.12, the correlation between expected quality of an app and the realized quality uh, of an app. So there's some predictability. It's not zero, some, some predictability. Joe, two minutes. What's that? Oh, I have two minutes? Perfect, <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> that's pretty good. All right, so um, what do I wanna say? So actually predictability does matter, right? So instead of the 34% reduction, the degree of predictability we have makes the reduction in, in, in CS about half as big, something like 17%. So it's still kind of a big-ish number, right? So it does matter. It, it was worth it to do that hard work last two slides. It does cut it, but it's still kind of a, a, a big-ish number. Okay, uh, two minutes. So I'm really coming in on time here. GDPR um, has had a big effect on the app market. Massive exit. That's fun to look at, but doesn't matter, dinosaurs and all. Uh, but way more important, a, a seemingly big slowdown in entry, in new entry. And again, my sort of ax to grind here, innovation with unpredictability is a big deal. That is, you know, if quality is unpredictable, then the welfare effects of either adding a bunch of products or subtracting a bunch of products, again, in entry, uh, can be substantial. And here with GDPR, we have substantial effects on consumers. I shouldn't have the word producers there. That's for a different version of the slides. Apologies. Um, but big caveats, big caveats. Uh, I mean, I've already sort of talked about, you know, the skeletons in the data closet and all that. But I think the bigger caveat is the issue about what does this say about the advisability of GDPR? And I think it says it's, 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 it's at most half the story, right? There are benefits to GDPR that we don't really make any attempt to quantify here. What this is about is a potential cost to imposing a privacy regulation that has an effect on, on entry. And so this is at most part of the puzzle. We don't have an answer to the question, is GDPR a terrible idea? We just, we just don't. People are assumed that we are saying that. We're not saying that. Um, we're just saying uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the innovation side, it seems to have an effect on the, on the um, value of the choice set that would ensue in the long run uh, under this policy versus not under this policy. And I think with that, I am, I am done. Thank you so much, Joe. Our discussion is a um, question, Pilker. And I should stop sharing, right? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to read this paper and uh, uh, to use five minutes to talk about it. So um, I'll start with things that I like. Um, I like that uh, you guys are looking at the supply side effects, which I think is very important and interesting. I like that you're being uh, able to estimate welfare effects. I think that's great. And it's, uh, it's especially done in a very clever way here. It's also an impressive data set, not only the, the data that uh, Joel talked most about, which is the secondary data, but also I, I, I like the survey that gives you some you know, qualitative uh, insights on what the developers are actually doing. And then the last thing I like is, of course, the authors. Um, these are one of the um, sort of the dream team um, that, that I can think of. Um, so. I have a couple of you know comments slash questions. Um, first, um, with respect to the model, when I say model, I, I'm, I'm in, I mean the, the theoretical framework. It's not entirely clear to me that revenues must fall. So it could be that GDPR drives a selection of high types into pre premium versions of apps, um, a bit like in, in some of the GDPR, GDPR papers or privacy um, papers where there's some kind of uh, trade-off between um, giving up your privacy and, and paying a price for an app. Um, and it could could be that revenues um, can be driven by in-app purchases um, or even by changing business models because of GDPR. And I think you have some evidence um, that, that apps are actually changing their, um, their privacy intrusiveness and, and there might also be you know, a different business model behind this than 
Um, did the other comment that I had was, I was thinking whether, you know, most likely it's not, but maybe it's a problem that the price coefficient is only identified um, with, with premium apps that have a positive price. Um, and there's not a lot of them, about 6%. Um, and for most, most of what you do, I, I don't think it will matter. Um, but um, I think where it might matter is uh, because it might be consistent with defining that, which you didn't talk about, Joel, uh, that you get a positive coefficient when you try to include the number of privacy sensitive permissions. So, so I think there's sort of some, some kind of, um, uh, you know, slice to be made in the, in the data between um, free and, and paid for apps. Um, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and that might help you to, uh, to address the elephant in the room, which is, of course, you know, um, are you really capturing the full consumer surplus? And I know you explicitly want to talk about sort of the cost of GDPR and not so much about the benefits, but I think it could really help if you could expand a little bit on the, on the ana short analysis that you have in a paper um, or you didn't talk about here, um, where, where you try to incorporate a bit these um, uh, changes in, in privacy sensitive permissions that, um, that the apps have. Because I think this, this gives you a lot of, you know, could, could give you a lot of traction in um, um, not getting these types of comments that, that, I, that I give you. Um, and I have a couple more minor things, but uh, I'd rather leave the floor to, to other people who have questions.